Hello, and welcome to this accessible virtual tour of the Orange County Museum of Art, OCMA Expands, fourth season exhibition, which currently, as of the time of this recording in fall 2020, features recent work by three contemporary Pacific Rim artists, Marcia Alexander Clark, Kyungmi Shin, and Mary Rose Cobarubias Mendoza. As we engage with the artwork and biographies of each artist, recurring and interrelated themes will emerge, including, but not limited to, identity, cultural legacy, immigration, globalization, and colonialism. My name is Erin Schalk, and I'll be your narrator for this exhibition tour. Before we begin, allow me to explain the steps we've taken to achieve a higher level of accessibility with this virtual exhibition tour. First, the tour is available in two main formats. Number one, narrated audio tracks, and number two, a video slideshow with audio narration and video captions. No matter how you choose to experience this virtual exhibition, you'll soon notice that I provide highly detailed descriptions of each artwork discussed. This practice is typically known as audio description or descriptive narration. And by composing an illustrative, verbal picture of the artworks, I'm assisting blind and visually impaired viewers with experiencing the works in their mind's eyes. In addition, the video slideshow format offers viewers with low levels of residual vision to increase the size of the artwork images on a computer screen or specially designed television screen for easier viewing. Moreover, the slideshow's video captions, also known as open captions in this case, are specifically designed to benefit viewers with hearing loss, as well as viewers who may experience cognitive challenges. This accessible virtual tour will be presented in the following format. First, we'll gain insight into each artist's life and history by taking a close look at her biographical statement. In addition, we'll examine each artist's exhibition summary to acquire a snapshot understanding of the artwork. Second, we'll learn more about specific works by the artist currently on display at the OCMA. Unfortunately, an in-depth discussion of every artwork is beyond the scope of this recording, but I've carefully selected specific pieces we'll explore in further detail. This is where audio description comes in. I will describe the primary physical features of each piece, such as size or dimensions, colors, textures, imagery, position in the exhibition space, materials, processes, or techniques used to make the artwork, and so forth. Third, we'll learn more about the artist's intentions for and ideas behind her work, including historical information, symbols and themes, and the work's connections to the artist's personal experiences, if provided. And now, it's time to begin our virtual exhibition tour. We'll start with sculptures by Mary Rose Cobarubias Mendoza, then we'll transition to ceramic and installation work by Kyungmi Shin, and lastly, we'll finish with an audio-video work by Marcia Alexander Clark. We'll begin with the bio of artist Mary Rose Cobarubias Mendoza, as her work currently comprises the OCMA's entire first floor. She was born in 1966 in Manila, Philippines, and today she lives and works in Los Angeles, California. Quote, Using memory, material significance, and personal narratives, Mary Rose Cobarubias Mendoza's work expresses circumstances of cultural amnesia and post-assimilation through processes of the handmade. End quote. Now, we'll continue with an overview of historical and cultural themes surrounding Mendoza's work. Exhibition Description Mary Rose Cobarubias Mendoza, Navigating Technics, guest curated by Ricardo J. Reyes, Ph.D. Quote, Filipino-American artist Mary Rose Cobarubias Mendoza's work uses humor to confront the notion of decolonization. A master object maker, Mendoza plays with scale through larger-than-life and miniaturized sculptures made of quotidian materials. From a crayon enlarged to the height of the artist, to lined binder paper used by American schoolchildren folded into a human-sized boat, 
Mendoza takes the viewer back to elementary school to relearn history omitted from American textbooks, specifically the United States occupation of the Philippines from 1898 to 1946. The work Missing Information, a small painting of books that tell of important Filipino historical events, suggests a need to rewrite histories for a deeper understanding of Filipino-American history. Tossed, a crumpled sheet of paper on which the phrase benevolent assimilation is repeated, evokes a handwriting exercise or punishment, reminding viewers of the effects of American colonial policy in the Philippines. End quote. Now, if you were to physically set foot inside the OCMA, you'd proceed straight ahead through the front doors and take a right through two glass double doors into the first floor gallery. And this gallery is home to Mendoza's prolific body of artwork. The first floor gallery is bisected by a wide staircase in the center that leads up to the second floor, so you have the option of proceeding through the first floor gallery in either a clockwise or counterclockwise fashion. Today, we'll move counterclockwise. Upon entering the first floor's double doors, we immediately encounter an artwork titled Tossed from 2018. This is made from paper, colored pencil, and graphite, and the paper itself measures 8.5 by 11 feet, with dimensions variable. Immediately, we notice a conscious play on the standard size of computer or lined paper in the United States, which typically measures 8.5 by 11 inches. Tossed is very much like an oversized piece of loose leaf paper you may have used in school, a piece of plain white paper that has been crumpled up into a large ball and tossed onto the floor, but its large scale, which in this case means its large size in relationship to other objects, as well as its large size compared to what we expect a standard piece of paper to measure, puts this artwork in the realm of sculpture. Immediately, for many of us, this may resurface old memories of having to do writing practice in school, making any number of mistakes, and then ultimately crunching up the paper into a wad in frustration and throwing it to the ground. Now, when you approach Tossed more closely, there are faint traces of pencil on the paper's surface. This writing is quite difficult to read between the folds of paper and also due to the light color of the graphite, but upon closer inspection, the words benevolent assimilation have been written again and again across the white sheet. Guest curator Rico Reyes describes Mendoza's ideas behind Tost in the following statement. Quote, Having explored the iconic ruled line paper in her work since 2010 to reference associations to education, America, and personal educational experience, Mendoza created several 8.5 foot by 11 foot oversized ruled line paper sculptures to express the enormity of American power and influence on Filipinos and Filipino Americans. In Tost, Mendoza repeatedly drew the phrase benevolent assimilation, the 1898 political policy used by the McKinley administration to convey the United States, quote, helpful, unquote, intentions toward the Filipino people, end quote. Next, we'll take a look at ISM from 2018, made from paper and colored pencil, and the paper itself measures 8.5 by 11 feet, with dimensions variable. The entire installation, in this case, meaning all the components that make up this particular artwork, is approximately 14 to 16 feet long. ISM is positioned immediately to the right of Tost, again, just beyond the double doors into the first floor gallery. Like Tost, ISM is made up of sheets of oversized loose leaf paper that are arranged sculpturally. ISM is comprised of multiple pieces of paper, First, there are three pieces of large-scale loose leaf, in the sense that there are three holes punched in the side for a three-ring binder, a thin pink vertical line adjacent to the three holes, and a series of narrow blue horizontal lines for writing. They stretch across the gallery floor like a bedspread, similar in size to large blankets or quilts, but these pages also undulate slightly. To compare, imagine ocean water moving toward a shoreline in soft waves. The second piece of paper is a folded boat and sits atop these 
pieces of loose leaf. To compare, imagine the paper boat like a traditional folded origami boat. If you're not directly familiar with how an origami boat looks or feels, picture the paper this way. There's a triangular peak in the center, and it's tucked into and surrounded on all sides by a somewhat almond-shaped bowl. Also, to give a concrete sense of the size of this paper boat, say you're a person of relatively average height, for example, measuring between 5 foot 4 and 5 foot 9. If you were to stretch out your arms to the sides, holding them much like a large bird spreading its wings, this paper boat is a similar width. ISM also offers an extended label with additional text to explain Mendoza's intentions for the artwork. Quote, the title of this work, ISM, refers to a suffix derived from ancient Greek and meaning taking sides with. Over the years, ism has become a standalone word that is often used to pejoratively describe unconscious adherence to certain ideologies, including racism, colonialism, feminism, patriotism, etc. In her work ism, Mendoza has folded oversized lined notebook paper into the shape of a boat. For Mendoza, the work is a visual metaphor for American colonial policies in the Philippines and alludes to schools as the vehicle for teaching isms and the boat as a means for these ideas to travel from one place to another, end quote. Now, moving counterclockwise from the first floor gallery's entrance, we'll proceed to the far wall directly across from the entrance's double doors. Here, we'll encounter Capua from 2018, made from cardboard and blue-green spray paint. It measures approximately 15 by 7.5 feet, with dimensions variable. Capua is comprised of a series of over 25 square, brown cardboard boxes that have been flattened to rest flush against the wall. Overall, they are quite uniform in shape and size, and they've been stacked into a pyramid with four tiers. Ten boxes on the bottom, eight boxes on the second tier, four boxes on the third, and three boxes on the top. The first tier is slightly unique compared to the other three. If you move from left to right, you'll find that a small pink box, much like the size of a donut box, sits atop the ninth brown cardboard box on the first tier. These brown cardboard boxes have the letters Kapwa spray painted across the center and underscored by a flourished underline. Both the underline and the typeface or font used to spell out Kapwa can be compared to the Coca-Cola logo. For example, the capital K dramatically curls at each end. I should mention that while 25 boxes printed with Kapwa are immediately visible to us, Mendoza also creates a sense of perspective, and it's implied that additional cardboard boxes sit in stacks behind those with the logos in front, creating an arrangement of approximately 50 boxes. Additional complexity is created by a handful of fully three-dimensional boxes that are also made from brown cardboard like the boxes on the wall, and also have the same blue-green logo painted in the center. These boxes have been fully assembled and sit on the gallery floor near the wall installation. Taken together, both types of Kapwa boxes create a unique sense of space, shifting from two to three dimensions and back again. To better understand Mendoza's intentions for the work, we'll examine Kapwa's extended label. Quote, this piece evokes the Filipino cultural value of kapwa, a Tagalog word meaning shared being or self and others. Here, kapwa is represented as a logo inscribed on cardboard boxes that suggest industrialization and global circulation of goods. Mendoza offers to our fast-moving and alienating world the hope of kapwa, a call for radical empathy. End quote. Now, as we continue in a counterclockwise circle in the first floor gallery, we find ourselves almost where we started. If we picture ism and tossed positioned at 5 and 6 o'clock respectively, and kapwa at 12 o'clock, this next artwork rests approximately between 7 and 8 o'clock. Here we find Terrace from 2018, made from found cardboard boxes, measures approximately 10 to 15 feet with dimensions variable. In terms of materials, visual appearance, and the arrangement of the cardboard boxes in a cluster on the wall, Terrace, at first glance, seems to have quite a few connections to Capua. 
While the boxes used in Kapwa are arranged in an orderly fashion, and each box is a similar square shape with distinct 90 degree angles, Terrace, in comparison, is more freeform in appearance. The boxes are compressed together in a somewhat triangular or pyramid like shape, with the stack the widest at the base and tapering up to a small point toward the upper left, and not the center. The boxes themselves are a collage of various colors and logos. For example, there are standard brown cardboard boxes advertising brands such as Kellogg's, Marlboro, and Marca Pina Soy Sauce. Also, there are other boxes with brands known for particular color schemes such as a bright orange Tide box and a deep emerald green Starbucks box. Another important note about Terrace is the box's unique arrangement. While they sit flush against the wall, their sides and position create a sense of perspective, meaning that the boxes at the base are larger and seem to be projecting toward you, whereas the boxes positioned at the top are smaller overall and seem to be receding from you. Another way to understand how Terrace's boxes are arranged is to think of a large baggage carousel at an airport. Imagine that the carousel is piled high with bags and suitcases, layers upon layers, not only on the conveyor belt, but also in the center of the carousel. Imagine that you're standing on one of the long sides of the carousel, so those cases that are closest to you appear the largest. However, all of the luggage that curves around to the opposite side of the carousel, as well as the items piled in the middle, appear much smaller because they are positioned farther from you. Rather than existing in three dimensions, picture all of these bags sitting flat against the white gallery wall, then replace the imagery of suitcases with cardboard boxes, and now you have a fairly clear picture of how Terrace appears. Rays sheds additional light on the meaning behind Terrace in the following statement. Quote, this work references terraces in the Philippines, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, that were carved in the mountains by indigenous peoples and used for cultivating rice. As in many developing countries, labor has shifted from farming to mass production. Industrial waste has become an ecological disaster in the Philippines, creating mountains of garbage like the Smoky Mountain outside of Manila." End quote. As an additional note, if you're not familiar with rice terraces, including the UNESCO-recognized terraces in the Philippines, picture level after level of graduated stair steps that are carved into the soil of a verdant, grassy slope. Next in our tour, we'll head upstairs to the second floor gallery, and it's here that we find the work of artists Kyungmi Shin and Marcia Alexander Clark. We'll begin with Shin first, and to better understand the placement of her work, I'll describe the layout of the gallery space. Her work is positioned in the middle of the second floor gallery, which, like the first floor, is also bisected by the large staircase. Picture a long and fairly wide rectangular hallway that stretches out before you, and imagine this hallway is divided into thirds vertically. Moving from left to right, the first third has a series of three connected sections that function almost like small private rooms inside a house or similar domestic space. The second third is, of course, the staircase, and the last third, the third on the right, also has three adjacent rooms. You can also picture a 2 by 3 grid with a total of six squares, or in this case, six small intimate room-like spaces you'll just want to remember that the staircase runs through the middle of this grid. It's also important to note that the series of small installation spaces on the left feature portrait busts of Shin's father, and those on the right feature portrait busts of Shin herself, creating a sense of two identities that are simultaneously in conversation with, but also somewhat separated from each other. We'll explore the work within one particular room in just a moment, but let's continue with the artist's biographical statement. Kyungmi Shin was born in South Korea, and today she lives and works in Los Angeles, California. Quote, Kyungmi Shin creates sculptures and installations to investigate the intersection of her family heritage from South Korea and the effect of globalization. She has completed over 20 public artworks, and her most recent public video sculpture was installed at the Netflix headquarters in Hollywood, California in 2017. She received an MFA degree from the University of California, Berkeley." End quote. 
Exhibition Description Kyungmi Shin, Father Crosses the Ocean Curated by Cassandra Koblenz Quote Kyungmi Shin examines the impact of colonialism on cultural exchange through the lens of her family's experience emigrating from South Korea to the United States. Through photo collages and porcelain busts she made of herself and her father, a Christian minister, Shin explores the influence of Eastern philosophy on Western culture. She looks to the history of the Chinese porcelain trade that gave rise to chinoiserie ceramics, which combined European and Asian elements as emblematic of a cultural hybridity that resulted from European colonialism. In a style and technique borrowed from chinoiserie, she inscribes onto her self-portraits imagery from the story of the Monkey King, a famous Chinese and Pan-Asian character who battles worldly temptations and inner demons to achieve spiritual enlightenment. Similarly, she decorates the busts of her father with references to monsters and demons in medieval illuminated manuscripts depicting Christian stories, further highlighting parallels between Eastern and Western spiritual teachings." End quote. Before we continue into the artworks themselves, allow me to explain the meaning of and a brief history behind Chinoiserie. In approximately the 17th and 18th centuries in the West, it became popular to emulate, and in some cases reinterpret, certain styles, motifs, and techniques used in Chinese and East Asian ceramics, furniture, fiber art, interior decoration, and garden design. In the 17th and 18th centuries in Europe, Rococo art had gained full steam, and this movement emphasized ornamentation, for example, an abundance of decoration, often with curving or scroll-like forms. Chinoiserie in the West often fused aspects of traditional Chinese and East Asian aesthetics with Rococo elements. However, as you can imagine, Western interpretations of Chinese and East Asian fine art and decorative arts, in many cases, failed to fully comprehend the philosophical, historical, and spiritual contexts in which the original works were created. Next, we'll proceed to Shin's work. Recall that the six installation rooms are arranged in a 2 by 3 grid. We'll take a close look at the pieces that make up the room in the upper right corner of that grid. As you face this intimate installation space, there are four major areas where work is organized, and we'll imagine these as points on a compass. At the north point hangs a large scale two-dimensional piece that is combination digital print and painting, and this work hangs against a white wall. At the south point, and if you were physically present in the gallery space, this is the area that you would likely be standing closest to is a large circular table filled with porcelain and ceramic sculptures, primarily in very pale celadon-like green hues. To the west, there's an arrangement of pieces that rest against a blue-green wall. First, there's a cabinet, a bit like a small dresser, and atop this cabinet is a self-portrait bust of Shin. Behind this bust hangs an oval-shaped porcelain disc surrounded by a wooden frame. And lastly, to the east, and also against a blue-green wall, there's an arrangement of three painted ceramic plates sitting atop a piece of wooden furniture, much like an antique desk. We'll start with the series of plates displayed on the desk. Together, these are titled Chinoiserie Group No. 3, a grouping of ceramic plates and vintage furniture that measures 48 by 31 by 15 inches. The desk itself is a medium brown color with ornate, flower-like knobs on each drawer. There are three drawers across, as well as additional drawers on the left and right sides. The three plates are positioned on top of the desk and held upright by three small, clear display stands. Each plate is carefully painted with colorful glazes, creating a range of surface decoration that's both rooted in landscape but also unique to each plate. Moving from left to right, the first plate is a landscape scene that looks to be an aerial or bird's eye view. The plate itself is almost entirely a pale powder blue color, with the exception of some small land formations with patches of medium green foliage that peek in at the edges. If the plate were the face of a clock, you'd find small white island or coast-like shapes at 1, 3, 6, 7, and 11 o'clock. Also, if you were to divide this first plate down the center horizontally, you'd find a brown and green bridge that waves in a very slight S-curve and connects 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock. 
Next, the center plate is positioned slightly behind the first and third, making for a subtle V-shape. This plate is primarily a creamy off-white color with medium blue glaze decoration that also fades to pale blue. On the left side of the plate, there appears to be a thick branch from either a tree or a plant, and from this branch sprout large compound leaves. On the right side of the plate, there's a large, deeper blue organic shape at 3 o'clock. Perhaps it's part of a rock or a cliff ledge, or perhaps a cluster of dense foliage. Delicate lines protrude from the top, side, and bottom of this shape. These lines appear to be almost like willow branches, and they hang downward. Gravity seems to be pulling them toward the bottom of the plate. And now to the third plate positioned on the right. Visually and formally, this plate has a fair amount in common with the first. Again, we're seeing the entire landscape seen as if from a bird's eye view. Much of the plate is pale blue, but the water source is broken up with connected patches of land that arc from 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock. In addition, more fingers of land appear at 4 and 5 o'clock, as well as 7 o'clock. And all of these pieces are connected by another strip of land in the center. Taken together, the land almost forms a figure 8 shape, with the water making up the two center circles of the 8. This scene bursts with foliage and architectural structures. Across the top of the plate are a series of deep emerald green trees and shrubs and clusters, almost appearing like a forest, and their pale green shadows reflect on the glassy surface of the painted water. If we were to divide the plate into quarters, the lower right corner is filled with four wooden homes, depicted as having multiple stories and curved roofs. These dwellings are peppered with medium green trees and shrubs, accented with highlights of lemon yellow. Two additional homes are positioned at 7 and 8 o'clock on the plate. Overall, plates 1 and 2 make use of significant open space, and they give the impression of quietness and stillness. In contrast, plate 3 possesses significantly more visual information and feels as if it is bustling with activity. Next. We'll move back toward the large circular table, our south point. This section is titled Chinoiserie Group No. 4, 50 by 50 by 24 and a half inches, porcelain and ceramic sculptures, vintage furniture. Overall, this table is a medium brown color and features scrolled, plant-like designs in a light-colored wood that run along the table's edge. The table itself is positioned significantly lower than us. An average-sized adult will find that it reaches somewhere between the knee and mid-calf. On top of the table, Shin creates a complex arrangement of ceramic and porcelain vessels and sculptures, and almost all of these works were glazed with a pale green and highly transparent glaze. If you are facing the table and looking into the installation space, there's an arrangement of small ceramic pedestals. You could almost compare these to miniature cake stands, and they sit both individually on the table as well as in a small stack of three. Ceramic flowers are positioned on top of, as well as next to, many of these stands. These flowers are highly organic forms. If you place the sides of your hands together and cup your palms, just as if you were trying to catch water in your hands to drink or splash on your face, you have a sense of how these flowers are shaped. These flowers also have layers of overlapping petals that curve toward each other and the flower centers. Again, you can imagine the petals as softly folded pieces of overlapping cloth, and many of the petals feature finely carved lines or veins that add subtle texture. Next, there's a ceramic portrait bust of Shin. Rather than pause here, I'll describe the second portrait bust of Shin, positioned at the west point of the installation in greater detail in a few moments. As you continue around the circumference of the table, there are additional stacks of ceramic stands, flower sculptures, and a small vase with a narrow neck. It too is pale translucent green, but the inside of the vase is painted gold. In the center of this arrangement is a ceramic sculpture of a hand and forearm. The hand and arm are straight, and the forefinger points toward the table's 12 o'clock position. Lastly, there's a large arcing handle attached from the inside of the arm's elbow to the wrist. Picture the ear-shaped handle on a standard coffee or tea mug, and you have a sense of what this handle on the arm looks like. To gain a better understanding of Chinoiserie Group No. 4, we'll pause for a moment and consider Shin's intentions for the work, as explained in the extended label. Quote, 
In this series of works, Shin combines vintage furniture with ceramic sculptures of symbolic elements from Asian fables, such as the peach that represents long life, or historic events that influenced East-West dynamics, such as the Opium War, from 1839 to 1860, and Opium Trade. Some of these sculptural elements represent parts of Shin's body to connect the cultural hybridity represented in Chinoiserie to the dual influence of Eastern and Western cultures in her own life. End quote. Now we'll move to the West Point where we have two works that interact with each other Journey to the West, 10,000 Years Fruit, 2019, Porcelain Wood Frame, 32 by 39 by 1 inch, and Self Portrait, 10,000 Years Fruit, 2019. Porcelain Wood Furniture, 54 by 21 by 18 inches. Like Chinoiserie Group No. 3, where the ceramic landscape plates were positioned on a Western-style wooden desk, Self-Portrait 10,000 Years Fruit involves a Western-style wooden cabinet. The two scrolled cabinet doors, as well as the furniture's top, are pale wood, and the entire piece is trimmed in dark, almost black wood. Positioned on top of this cabinet is a portrait bust of Shin in white porcelain. We see Shin's head, neck, part of her shoulders, her collarbones, and her portrait bust rests on a small circular porcelain stand. The sculpture of Shin gazes forward intently, and her expression remains neutral overall. Her mouth is closed, her eyebrows arch naturally over her eyes and aren't raised or furrowed. Her hair is also gathered into a bun at the top of her head. On the left side of her neck, there's a shape similar to a scarf or ascot, painted in white with red floral patterns. Hanging above and behind the portrait bust is Journey to the West, 10,000 Years Fruit, 2019. The background of the oval ceramic disc is painted in similar red and white floral patterns as the shape on the side of the self-portrait bust. Stretching from the bottom right is a tree branch, painted in white and accented with medium blue lines. Leaves, similar in shape to banana or palm leaves, hang down from the branches, as well as two fruits, two abstracted figures, one that is large and placed almost in the very center of the oval. The other is the same abstracted shape, but quite a bit smaller and hangs below the first. Like the tree and leaves, they're white with medium to deep blue outlines. Both figures have two dots to represent eyes, and an additional dot in the center of their abdomens, much like navels. However, there are no indications of noses, mouths, or other features. Lastly, this brings us back to our North Point to Garden, 2020, archival Epson print, painted and cut, 60 by 80 inches. This painted photo collage draws upon an array of motifs and imagery from Chinese and East Asian art, including the background, which features intricate knot patterns in light and medium gray tones. On the left side and in the lower right corner are dark charcoal shapes that resemble the steep mountains, often depicted in traditional ink paintings. A man appears in the center, rendered in black and white, and he is positioned behind an intricate network of stair steps, bridges, foliage, flowers, and a small hut that zigzag from right to left. Unlike the rest of the image, this central section uses color, primarily soft shades of green, tan, and pink. Moving along, we're still located on the OCMA second floor. If we continue straight past Shin's exhibition and farther from the central staircase, we'll find ourselves at a horizontal, rectangular gallery space. Here we encounter recent work by artist Marcia Alexander Clark. To note, Alexander Clark's exhibition is expansive and includes three videos, as well as three prints. However, in this virtual exhibition tour, I will focus on an in-depth exploration into one of her video works because Alexander Clark's videos are especially accessible to a wide range of audiences, since they can be experienced in real time, even outside of a traditional gallery setting. In addition, those with visual impairments can experience the video's rich, overlapping sound, and those with hearing challenges can appreciate the video's graceful progression of images. Marcia Alexander Clark was born in 1939 in Valparaiso, Chile. 
Today, she lives and works in Altadena, California. Quote, Working with video as her primary medium, Marcia Alexander Clark creates unfamiliar geometrical forms that are new to the visual vocabulary through the gestures of cropping, marking, and editing. Her video work stems from a lineage of painting, including works of post-impressionism, cubism, and abstract expressionism. Alexander Clark came to the United States from Chile and gained fine art training in Missouri, New York, and California. End quote. Exhibition Description Marcia Alexander Clark, Ojos Profundos, curated by Cassandra Koblenz. Quote, Marcia Alexander Clark's exhibition, consisting of recent video work and prints, explores the nuances of cultural identity. Born and raised in Chile, but living most of her life in America, Alexander Clark often felt she never fully belonged to either culture. She describes this experience as akin to seeing the world through a keyhole, getting only a glimpse into the different worlds in which she lived. This point of view is reflected in her video works, in which she reveals thin slivers of video imagery, obscuring a wider view. She layers and repeats these slices of footage like an alphabet or musical score to compose shimmering abstract lines surrounded by fields of color. Music is an important source for the underlying structure of Alexander Clark's compositions. In her multimedia installations, configurations of flickering lines operate in concert with choral arrangements to create a meditative experience of sound and image. End quote. Now we're going to take a close look at Alexander Clark's video, Horas de la Noche, Hours of the Night, from 2019. For this work, we'll begin slightly differently. I'll read the extended label to you first, as well as provide some brief background information. After, you'll have the opportunity to experience the first five minutes of the artwork. Quote, Horas de la Noche, Hours of the Night, 2019. Digital video, 13 minutes, 9 seconds, courtesy of the artist. Choral arrangement composed by Anna Pechanik, Ancheta, performed by local caller, Idlewild, California. Choir members, Suzanne K. Caparelli, Jane Davis, Dora Dillman, D. Easterly, Christina Gower, Bronwyn Jones, Carol McClintock, Barbara Pelham, Erica C. Stallings, Cynthia Thompson, Trish Tooley, and Shanna Zorn. The imagery in this video shifts in response to the choral arrangement of four songs inspired by early poems of famed Chilean poet and diplomat Pablo Neruda. Born and raised in Chile, Alexander Clark has found inspiration in Neruda's subtle play of language and exploration of dark emotions. This piece aims to evoke that sensibility through image and sound. For this video, Alexander Clark layered and repeated slices of footage to create visual compositions of shimmering abstract lines accompanied by fields of color. She established an organizing framework that formed each visual gesture in correspondence with the choral composition, like a musical canon, a piece of music where a melody is played and then imitated. End quote. To provide a brief historical context, Pablo Neruda was born in Chile in 1904 and lived until 1973. He was a deeply acclaimed poet during his lifetime through the present day, receiving the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1971 and lauded as one of the 20th century's greatest poets. In North America, Neruda is well known for the English translation of his 20 love poems and a song of despair. However, he wrote powerful poetry about a wide variety of topics beyond love, including surrealism, history, and politics. Neruda also was a highly influential diplomat and political figure. He was part of the Chilean Senate and ultimately in 1950 received the International Peace Prize. Before we experience the first five minutes of Horas de la Noche, it's important to note that the video begins with a quotation from Neruda's poem entitled The Light Wraps You. The English translation of this quote is, Of the night, great roots grow suddenly from your soul. 
In Horas de la Noche, we hear a choir of multiple overlapping voices singing portions of this quotation in Spanish at a time. For example, there are moments when we hear harmonized repetitions of De la Noche. The music itself, especially due to the blending and overlapping of voices, ranges from soft, otherworldly, and quite meditative, to even somewhat foreboding, as if warning of coming tragedy. Regarding the video's visual elements, we see progressions of thin, vertical rectangles that show portions of the choir members' faces and typically focus on one aspect of the face, such as an ear, mouth and nose, and so forth. We also see the choir members singing in real time, and quite often the rectangles are arranged and animated to correspond with the rhythm of the music. For example, if the music begins to crescendo or increase in sound, in many cases either more rectangles with portions of the singer's faces appear, or the level of motion within each rectangle increases, creating a unique visual experience of sound. Now, please sit back and allow yourself these five contemplative minutes to experience the first portion of Horas de la Noche.
And this concludes our accessible virtual tour of the OCMA Expand's fourth season exhibition. Thank you very much for joining me, and we sincerely hope that you enjoyed learning about the work of artists Marcia Alexander Clark, Kyungmi Shin, and Mary Rose Cobarubias Mendoza. Please continue to take care and stay safe. <laughs>